Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The part of God's Word we'll consider together this morning is our gospel lesson for today, the gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter, beginning with verse 2. While John was in prison, he heard about the things Christ was doing. He sent two of his disciples to ask him, Are you the coming one, or should we wait for someone else? Jesus answered them, Go, report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the gospel is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not take offense at me. As these two were leaving, Jesus began to talk to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? No. Those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. So what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and he is much more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Amen, I tell you. Among those born of women, there has not appeared anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is God's Word. Please be seated. not easy to wait, is it? When things take longer than you think they should, it starts to get a little uncomfortable. When things don't happen the way you think they should, you wonder what's going wrong. During the season of Advent, we talk about waiting. And if we wait, if we feel like we're waiting too long, or if we feel like this isn't the thing that's supposed to be happening, doubts come up. It's human nature. It's normal. And doubts came up in John's heart, too. And what's interesting is how Jesus dealt with those doubts and his evaluation of John the Baptist after he doubted. When John was in prison, I mean, we can stop there. This may not be the way John thought things were supposed to be going for the one who is preparing the way for Christ. He knew he was doing God's work. He knew what the message that he had was from God and that people needed to hear it. And yet, he was in prison. And he was in prison for doing the right thing. He was in prison for saying what God told him to say. He was in prison because he told King Herod that he had someone else's wife and he was committing adultery. So Herod threw him in prison. And of course, we know from the history of Scripture that he wouldn't get out of of prison. He would be executed there. And then he heard about the things that Christ was doing. Now, what's interesting is that the things that Christ was doing, the things that Christ was doing, wasn't the same as the things that John the Baptist was doing. John the Baptist was preaching repentance. John the Baptist was preaching a baptism for repentance. And Jesus wasn't baptizing people. His disciples were, but he wasn't. And his message wasn't all about repentance. I mean, it was there, but it was more about him 
and about the coming of the kingdom of God than it was about repenting and turning away from sin. And so John sent two of his disciples to ask him, are you the real thing? Or do we have to wait for someone else? Now, there's two things in there, I think, that are, that are important for us to recognize. The first thing is that we need to know what's real. We celebrate Christmas, but it's important to know what's real in Christmas. We need to know what's the big deal. Is it just about a time of the year when we're nicer to each other than other times of the year? If that's real, then that's what we're going to hang on to. Is it a time of year when we're a little more generous with each other than we are at other times of the year? Is that real? Or is that something that we just try for a while and then when Christmas is over we go back to what's really real? Or did Jesus, did God really come to be our Savior? And if God really came to be our Savior, then we really, really needed one. And we need one because we don't measure up. I think we recognize that's real. We recognize that we have a sinful heart and a sinful mind and a sinful life. And that as hard as we try, we didn't change it yet. It's still sinful. That's real. And we need someone to rescue us. And if it's not Jesus, the other thing we need to recognize is that if it's not Jesus, we have to find something, we have to find someone who will. These days, a lot of people turn to science. They figure science will save us. But of course, we recognize now the flaws of science, the gaps in science, the things that science cannot do. And so we turn, I don't know if we turn, but many people will turn to just people's good nature. Say, be a light in the darkness. We need to have, what, how many points of light are they looking for? And people are so disappointing. Because every once in a while, we'll find one who does something that's good. But with that one thing that's good, there's always a thousand things that are not. We need a Savior. And so he's asking Jesus, are you the one? I need to know. Because John wasn't dumb. He knew that he wasn't going to last long, and he needed to know where he stood. Soon he was going to stand before his Maker, and he needed to know where he stood. And so Jesus answered him, Go report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the gospel is preached to the poor. And the first thing we look at that list, we might look at and Jesus is saying, look at all the good things that I'm doing. But that's not what he's saying. Do you recognize what he's saying here? I am fulfilling prophecy. The things that were written about me all the things that the Messiah would do, all the things that the Christ would do, I'm doing those. And blessed is the one who does not take offense at me. Because while Jesus is doing all those things, at the same time, he's offending just about everybody. He's offending the Pharisees because he's saying, I am God himself. He's offending people who think they're good in themselves by saying, I am the Savior that you need. He's offending some of the disciples because he's not doing the things they think he should be doing, and he's offending others because he is doing things that they think is wrong. You think about what Jesus claimed about himself. 
How many people like that? How many people does it offend when Jesus says, I am the only way home? You can't do it. You're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. You don't have enough resources. Well, that's offensive. But we need to hear it. And what about all the other religions? Is he saying, your religion isn't real. Mine is the only one that's real. Well, that's offensive. Aren't we supposed to be tolerant of other people's beliefs? When in fact Christ is the only way home. And in fact, all religions that reject Christ are false and worthless and useless. Because there is such a thing as real truth. And that real truth is found in God, our Creator. And anything that rejects Him is false. Blessed is the one who does not take offense at me. And as these two were leaving, Jesus began to talk to the crowds about John. Because people are people. They haven't changed. You know, what, when someone comes and says, I have these huge doubts, and Jesus comes back and says, look at how I'm fulfilling Scripture. Everything's okay. You'll be all right. What is everyone else doing? Judging him. Saying, That's, he's not as strong as I thought. He's not what I expected. And Jesus is saying, do not judge someone in their weakness. Do not judge someone by their failures. Imagine if that's how God judged us. That instead of judging us by the faith that we have in Christ, by the forgiveness that He won for us on the cross, if He judged us by our worst moments and said, that's whom I see, none of us would survive it. And so Jesus talks to the crowd. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Is that why you went out there? To see if he's going to waver? It's like going to a, to a race just to watch the crashes. Do people really do that? Why, yes, they do. So were people going out into the desert to see a reed shaken by the wind? Jesus said, don't do that. What did you go out there to see? Did you go out there to see someone in soft clothes? Wrong place for that. Did you go to see a prophet? Yes, I tell you. And much more than a prophet. He's the one who prepared people for me. And God does amazing things with imperfect people. There is nobody on the planet Earth who will not fail at some point or another. But that does not mean that God cannot use them to do His work, to do great things. If God had to wait for perfect people to do His work, none of us need apply. But in fact, God does use perfect people, even for the big things even to be the forerunner of Christ. Not perfect, sinless people, but human beings like us. So what's He called you to do? And we can look at ourselves and we can say, well, I'm weak, I doubt, I have, I have sin, I, I don't, all these things would disqualify me from serving God, and yet we are precisely the kinds of people that God uses to do great things. Not because of our strength, but because of His. Not because of our wisdom, but because of His Word. So what are you going to do this Christmas? You're going to save a soul? You're going to change a life? You're going to shine the light of God's Word in a world that desperately needs to see it? 
are going to be God's servant, washed clean by the blood of Christ. <clears throat> this is the one about whom it is written, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And he says, Amen, I tell you. Among those born of women, there has not appeared anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now, these are people who are very impressed with Moses, very impressed with Elijah, very impressed with the prophets of old. And yet he said none of them was more important, none of them was greater than John the Baptist. And yet, whoever's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's one of the tough things in Scripture. What does he mean by that? There's a variety of things. Martin Luther thought that when he was said the least in the kingdom of heaven, he was referring to himself. That he, in his humiliation, carrying the sins of the world, was least in the kingdom of heaven and yet greater than John the Baptist. As John the Baptist had said, he who comes after me is greater than I am. Not everyone agrees with Martin Luther. There are those who say that what he's referring to is John the Baptist would never see the fulfillment. And whoever's least in the kingdom of heaven, those who know that Jesus died on the cross and can look on the pages of Scripture, have more than John the Baptist had. There are others who say that when he's talking about John the Baptist as forerunner, that's not as great as anyone who is forgiven by the blood of Christ. Which, of course, doesn't disclude. Is disclude a word? Doesn't. Do, I'm going to use it. Doesn't disclude John the Baptist. But it's not his place as forerunner that made him great, it's his place as forgiven Christian that is his real claim to greatness. But in any of these things, Jesus is telling us being in the kingdom of heaven is where we need to be, forgiven because Jesus died for us, rescued because Jesus saved us. Doesn't always look that way because God doesn't always do the things that we think he should be doing, and so sometimes we doubt. If life is particularly hard or the depression is particularly deep or the budget is particularly empty or if the future is particularly dim, we're tempted to think maybe God doesn't know what he's doing. Maybe there's something else I need to be hanging on to. And that's being human. And Jesus says to us what he says to John the Baptist. Go back and look at what Scripture says. Learn and grow and become strong. And then look to me. And I'll bring you home. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I came to be your Savior. I paid the ultimate price to make it happen. And I'm not going to leave you now. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.